Thank you, Professor Barham, for the introduction. And as you heard, the title of my talk is New Horizons in Fundamental Physics. And in this case, what I would like to do is to look towards the future of transmission electron microscopy. And I'll look towards the future in two very specific ways. What I'll do is to show how developments in instrumentation and techniques will now allow us to look more closely at dynamical processes in materials with atomic spatial resolution and also, separately, how we can use electron microscopy to study functional properties, functional processes in materials with the very highest poss possible spatial resolution. Now, many of these developments are associated with the introduction of aberration correction in electron microscopy. And there are two primary developments which have taken the field forward very substantially. The first development is in the correction of spherical aberration, correct, spherical aberration in transmission electron microscopes. And spherical aberration describes the different focal lengths of electrons that have traveled at different distances from the optic axis of the electron microscope. The second major aberration, which has limited the performance of microscopes since they were introduced in the 1930s, is chromatic aberration. And chromatic aberration describes the different focal lengths of electrons that have different energies. And these electrons may have different energies for two reasons. One reason is that the electron gun, the source of electrons, has a spread in the energies, the wavelengths of the electrons that it produces. The second reason is that as electrons travel through matter, they lose different amounts of energy. And each of these different processes, each of these aberrations of the electron microscope results in blurring of images and loss of spatial resolution. So if we look back to the types of electron microscopes that we would have used in perhaps the 1990s, these microscopes would have suffered from both of these deficiencies. In this case, spherical aberration and chromatic aberration limit the resolution so that structures were often not imaged with truly atomic spatial resolution. It was only in the late 1990s, with the advent of spher spherical aberration correction, as a result of the collaboration between Rosa, Haider, and Orban, that new hardware allowed spherical aberration to be corrected. In other words, the focal lengths of electrons that travel at different distances from the optic axis of the microscope were now the same, and the resolution was improved to better than the one angstrom level. But electron microscopy is a very rapidly developing subject. And the latest generation of instruments incorporates both chromatic and spherical aberration correction. And now, the electrons which have different energies also have their focal lengths corrected and in the most modern generation of electron microscopes, the spatial resolution is now improved to close to the half angstrom level. Now, these advances in electron microscopy are real breakthroughs. They also impose quite strict requirements on the stability of the microscope column, on the stability of the frame around the microscope, and on the stability of the building that houses it. Now, some of these improvements become apparent if we look at how images that we can acquire with transmission electron microscopy have evolved over the last 15 or 20 years. And if we first look at a simulation 
of one material, aluminium nitride, in a particular orientation. And we look at the type of image that we would have been able to acquire some 15 or 20 years ago. This image would have shown features on the atomic scale that the atomic structure is not resolved. With the advent of spherical aberration correction and using an instrument that would have been state-of-the-art in 2005, we now obtain images with better spatial resolution and finally now using the latest chromatic and spherical aberration corrected instrument, in our case the PICO electron microscope in Eulish, we obtain images with close to half angstrom resolution and in this case the atomic structure is resolved more clearly. This doesn't mean that the images are necessarily completely straightforward to interpret. They still require comparisons of the contrast with quantum mechanical image simulations. But the interpret interpretable resolution of individual images is improving towards the half to one angstrom level. So what chromatic aberration correction now allows us to do is first of all to improve the spatial resolution of structural and chemical information. And this improvement is greatest at the lower accelerating voltages. And these lower accelerating voltages are important because we use high energy electrons that damage many materials. Lower accelerating voltages allow us to look at beam sensitive materials with, with good spatial resolution. Combined chromatic and spherical aberration correction automatically provides better precision in atomic column position measurements. And the present generation of instruments offers the possibility of one picometer precision in atomic column position measurements. But the topic that I want to concentrate on first in this talk today is the potential for using chromatic aberration correction to help us to study in situ processes in materials. And by in situ, we may mean many different things. In situ electron microscopy encompasses a wide range of possible experiments. For example, in situ electron microscopy might mean using specialized sample holders to carry out in situ indentation experiments on materials. And in this case, we have an indentation experiment where we have dislocation which was pinned in an icosahedral quasicrystal sample forming two dislocation loops which are then released. In situ microscopy might refer to in situ heating of materials. And in this case, we are seeing the in situ heating of a complex metallic alloy at 450 degrees. This is beta aluminium magnesium. An in situ microscopy may also refer to the in situ introduction of gas into the electron microscope. And here we're looking at the nucleation of silicon crystals from gold uh, particles at 600 degrees with silane introduced into the electron microscope column. But in situ microscopy can also refer to the modification of materials with the electron beam itself. And here I'd like to show an example taken from a collaboration with Professor Henny Zanbergen and his group in the Technical University of Delft. And this collaboration involves using the electron beam to modify mono, mono, <coughs> a monolayer uh, thick samples of graphene. In other words, single atomic sheets of graphene, a material which has very exciting structural and electronic properties. And in this case, the reason for wanting to modify the structure of graphene is because many suggestions for devices based on graphene rely on being able to pattern single atomic layer thick sheets with atomic precision into structures that have nanometer sized dimensions. 
And this figure shows a hypothetical transistor structure. And this transistor structure relies on being able to pattern monatomic, monolayer thick sheet of graphene into an antidot lattice, in other words, into an array of holes, each of which has nanometer dimensions. In this, in this way, the idea is that graphene would have an artificial band gap introduced into the structure. So the question is, can we do this reliably and reproducibly with the electron beam in the electron microscope? And in fact, the answer is that we can, but using a very clever combination of in-situ heating of a sample together with the use of a very low accelerating voltage and chromatic and spherical aberration correction. And here we see an individual graphene flake placed on a heating element. The heating element itself is made lithographically. And we're now going to use chromatic and spherical aberration correction together to image graphene at elevated temperature on a small heating device. The way the experiment works is that a one angstrom diameter electron beam is moved slowly across the lattice to sculpt it into predefined shapes. And by moving the electron beam slowly across the lattice, individual atoms are knocked away to form extended defects. Then we can use the same electron beam, but now moving the electron beam faster across the lattice to image the same structure which has just been, just been patterned. And the trick here is that if an elevated sample temperature is used, then the surrounding pristine monolayer thick graphene lattice remains crystallographically perfect because any defects introduced by the electron beam are refilled by mobile car carbon atoms moving across the surface. At the same time, the resulting structure can be imaged with chromatic aberration corrected microscopy. So it's this clever combination of heating to 650 degrees with a low accelerating voltage, 80 kV, and chromatic and spherical aberration correction that allows this to work. And the resulting structures, starting from a very perfect uh, graphene lattice, can end up looking at lower magnification like this. And this slide shows an annular dark field image of individual bridges of graphene sculpted with the electron beam. It's a dark field image, and so everything which is bright corresponds to a single atomic layer of graphene. Everything which is dark corresponds to material which has been removed by the electron beam. And at every one of these four locations, we're left with a little bridge, which is just a couple of nanometers in width. And if we look at higher magnification with our chromatic aberration corrected pico microscope, then we see, again at elevated temperature, without damaging the graphene lattice, that the edges of the bridges are atomically straight, and also that single nanometer-sized holes can be patterned in the same graphene sheet. In other words, holes that are exactly the dimensions that we need for making artificial device structures. Furthermore, the, what is important here is that we use a combination of, first of all, spherical aberration correction applied to the condenser lens system of the microscope to form the one angstrom diameter beam that is used to sculpt the lattice, and then a combination of chromatic and spherical aberration correction in high resolution TEM to image the resulting final sculpted structure without damaging it. And now we can start to explore the combination of dwell time, how long the electron beam is held on the sample, together with the beam current density to form almost any structure we want. And as an example, I'll show a movie of two holes in a graphene lattice, which were made by the electron beam. 
and these holes have a little one or two atomic layer thick bridge separating them. The beam current density is just strong enough that the edges of each of the holes is knocked away by the beam slowly enough for us to see this process. If I play the movie, you might start to see the holes and the bridge in between them. The, gra the graphene lattice surrounding the two holes remains perfect because these are images taken at 650 degrees. The bridge in between the two holes is restructuring dynamically. And at a particular point in time, the bridge between t the two holes disappears and the two holes are linked together. So again, in this case, there's this image at low, imaging at low accelerating voltage, at elevated temperature, and with chromatic aberration correction, choosing the beam current density to enlarge the holes at a well-defined rate. So this is the example, one example of in situ microscopy of dynamical processes. The second topic I wanted to touch on is the use of chromatic aberration correction to help us to image magnetic fields in materials. And magnetic fields are familiar to all of us from school experiments where we image magnetic fields around bar magnets on a macroscopic scale. And the, the concept of an electromagnetic field originates from Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was in fact also the person who first introduced the concepts of electromagnetic induction and magnetic flux. Magnetic fields have also played a very prominent role here in Forschung Centrumulisch over the last few years, notably through the work of Peter Grunberg. And in this case, this is work on giant magnetoresistance. This is a quantum mechanical effect which describes the change in electrical resistance between closely spaced magnetic layers as their relative magnetization directions are changed. And giant magnetoresistance is now playing a key role in the design of higher density hard disk drive technologies and not only in the design of the reed heads in hard disk drives but magnetic fields also play a role in increasing the density of the magnetic recording media. What we would ideally like to do is to characterize the magnetic fields in device structures or in the recording media themselves in such a way that we can correlate the magnetic properties with structural properties and chemical properties all on a nanometer or atomic scale. And the question here is, is there a technique which allows us to measure magnetic fields with the same spatial resolution at which we can measure structural and chemical properties of materials? And the answer is there is such a technique, and this technique is referred to as electron holography. It's a technique which was initially proposed by Denis Gabor, for which he received the Nobel Prize. It was then taken forward by Professor Mollenstedt in Tübingen, and most recently it was pioneered by the groups of Tonomura in Japan, Pozzi in Bologna, and Hannes Lichter in Dresden. And this technique involves splitting the electron beam in a transmission electron microscope and then reforming an image using electrons that pass through a, a specimen by interfering those electrons with electrons that passed outside the specimen in a field-free region. And the reason this technique works is that it provides us with the only direct way of measuring the phase shift of the electron wave which passed through the sample. And the phase shift is important because it encodes information about magnetic fields and electrostatic potentials in the sample. 
And this information is usually lost if we record a bright field or dark field image of the same sample in focus in the electron microscope. So in this case, I'll start with an example of an electron hologram taken by Takeshi Kasama. And this is an electron hologram of the end of a multi-walled carbon nanotube which contains a ferromagnetic crystal inside it. The crystal is an alloy of iron and palladium, and it also happens to be the crystal that catalyzed the growth of the nanotube. This hologram looks like a conventional bright field image of the nanotube. The nanotube has a width of some 100 nanometers or so. But a normal bright field image contains no information about the fact that this crystal is magnetic. If we analyze the very fine interference fringes which make up the hologram, then we obtain a direct image of the magnetic field everywhere across the field of view with nanometer spatial resolution. And this is exactly equivalent to the types of magnetic fields that Michael Faraday observed 200 years earlier, but now it's obtained with a spatial resolution of a few nanometers. What's particularly important about this technique is first that it's quantitative, and second that it can be used to analyze structures which are much smaller than this. As an example, this is an array of small crystals of cobalt, which are each only 10 nanometers in size. And from a single image like this, this is a normal bright field image acquired in the microscope, it's impossible to predict what the magnetic state of every one of these crystals will be. By applying the technique of electron holography, recording the phase shift of the electron wave and analyzing the result, it's possible to show in colors this time that in this case, the crystals form an interesting vortex type of configuration where they spin magnetically around and every color shows the direction of the magnetic field, the magnetization of every one of the crystals, which is only 10 nanometers in size. As far as I'm aware, there is no other technique in the electron microscope or outside the microscope which can be used to record magnetic information inside small crystals with nanometer spatial resolution, absolutely quantitatively, and at the same time we obtain structural and chemical information about the same material. And why is this information important? For a number of reasons. The first reason is that magnetic crystals are used in all scientific disciplines, ranging from physics, chemistry, and biology to engineering. The second reason is that magnetic crystals, magnetic fields, are used in a very wide range of applications, ranging from drug delivery in medicine to magnetic recording, magnetic sensing, through to catalysis. And it's also important to study magnetic fields because the details of the effect of defects and, surface and surfaces of materials and interfaces on magnetic microstructure, in other words, the effect of the local crystallography and chemistry on magnetic microstructure is still not understood on an atomic scale. And so what would, we, what would we like to do in the future? And why do we need chromatic aberration correction? Well, the reason is that we would like to extend these measurements towards being able to image magnetic fields and materials with atomic spatial resolution. And chromatic aberration correction is necessary here because magnetic materials are usually imaged with the objective lens of the microscope switched off and then even with spherical aberration, the non-immersion lens of the microscope, which is used to form magnified images to record electron holograms, still suffers from chromatic aberrations. And so chromatic aberration correction, together with spherical aberration correction, is required to image magnetic fields as well. 
And why would we want to go towards imaging magnetic fields with atomic spatial resolution? Well, there are many new materials, for example, chiral magnetic structures in new materials such as skirmion lattices, which have been proposed for applications in magnetic recording or in spintronics. There, are, there is a pressing need also to understand concepts such as the effects of antiferromagnets on ferromagnets, in other words, the effect, uh, exchange bias effects, which are also key to the operation of hard disk drives. And in this case, the interaction of the antiferromagnets with the ferromagnets happens on an atomic scale and is still not fully understood. Finally, another key reason for studying uh, ma magnetic fields with close to atomic spatial resolution is the entire subject of magnetic semiconductors. And in this case, we can now obtain structural and chemical information with atomic spatial resolution from materials such as these, but there is still no understanding of how the local magnetic properties of many diluted magnetic semiconductors are related to the local structure, the local chemistry, and to the local defects. So in the future, we'd like to move towards imaging single magnetic spins on single atoms. This is a very challenging task ahead of us, but it's a task which can be at least tackled and at least approached using combined spherical and chromatic aberration correction in the new PICO microscope here in Eulish. But whether we talk about in situ electron microscopy or whether we talk about imaging functional properties of materials, we can also move in a slightly different direction. And this is the direction of applying stimuli to samples as we look at them inside the transmission electron microscope. And these stimuli could include changing the temperature of the sample. It could involve applying external magnetic fields or voltages. It could involve applying mechanical stimuli. And if we can do all of this and at the same time look at the functional properties and dynamic processes with close to atomic spatial resolution, then we're truly approaching a laboratory inside the electron microscope, a concept which has been proposed for many years. And so the future for electron microscopy, for understanding fundamental physics, is now looking very exciting. And we have many directions that we would like to follow. And this is where I would like to stop. Thank you for listening.